Coming up on the Mobile Content Creators Show. I did it secretly. And I did my, my recordings. I chopped up my little recordings and made them into a rudimentary mixed package. It was just two or three clips all put together in, in one little bit. And I then sent it in and then waited. And I waited to find out if anyone actually noticed that it had been recorded on a phone. If you're covering the world's news hotspots for the BBC using your mobile phone, when and how is the right time to use it? Welcome to the Mobile Content Creators Show. If you're a mobile journalist, marketer or creative who makes content on a mobile device or for mobile audiences, you're in the right place. Keeping you up to date with the fast moving world of mobile, here's your host and mobile video specialist, Mark Egan. So today's guest, I'm joined by Nick Garnett, who's a, a reporter with BBC Five Live, a radio reporter, but that's not everything he does. Um, Nick is a bit of a specialist uh, when it comes to reporting using his uh, mobile phone. Now, as always, Nick is out and about, so we join him from his car, sheltering from the rain. Uh, Nick, thanks for joining me. It's an absolute pleasure. Now, you know, one of the points of, you know, working for somebody like the BBC is you, you use all the good kit, you know, it's a proper, proper broadcaster. At which point were you out and about recording and you thought, instead of using the recorder that they've given me, maybe I'll just use my phone. Right, I'll take you right back to, to the very first moment that I thought that something had to change. And that goes back to 1988, uh, which is a long, long time ago. Uh, and I was lugging a Ewer reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, which was the machine that I had to use uh, all the time for all my recordings around Liverpool. Let me give you an example of just how awkward and cumbersome this machine is. It weighs the same as a new born baby. Imagine carrying a baby around. Well, if you're a pregnant woman, you know exactly what it's like carrying one of those around. Uh, you're carrying this around with you all day, every day, on one shoulder. It has uh, reels of tape that you only lasted 15 minutes. So you had to carry, if you wanted to do a lot of recording, you used to have to carry half a dozen reels of tape you used to have to carry batteries as well because it et batteries like uh like it, like nothing on earth uh and also it was all wires it was all cables it was all old leather straps that cut into your shoulders it was just awful and i was walking across liverpool uh i'd just been to interview the lord mayor of liverpool and i was on my way back to radio merseyside and i just thought there's got to be a better way it took the best part of 20 years until something actually changed. Uh, and over the over the years, there were small developments. There were things like mini disc recorders. There was digital audio cassette, which lasted about 15 minutes uh, on in, in, on the market before it uh, got superseded. Um, and, and various little devices did turn up, but they were all frankly rubbish. Digital recorders, flash mics, which was a, a, a solid state recorder. All these sort of things appeared, but they were, they were utterly useless. But it was only with the iPhone and the advent of the iPhone that things started to change. And I bought an iPhone as soon as they came out. I was looking at it and wondering, frankly, how I could use it. I knew that I what I wanted to use it for. Uh, and, and frankly, the first ones, the first model of iPhones really didn't do it. But when the iPhone 3G came out, the third generation, which was actually the second generation, I don't know why they called it the 3G, but they should have been the 2G. Their naming is anyway, never making any sense. Never, it? It's <laughs> never been right, has it? Uh, but when that came out, it suddenly opened up the market to be able to record on it. However, there was a big... Uh, intransigence from the broadcast industry to accept that anything like a phone could record audio. And was and that so, was that due to the image of it? It's being a phone. It's not a proper tool. Or was it because at that point the technology it wasn't actually quite up to scratch? Well, first of all, the technology wasn't quite up to scratch. If you were trying to record uh, stuff that sounded as if you'd recorded it in a studio, uh, but secondly, uh, it was the image. It was the idea of using something that you could get on the high street, and Right the way through my career, my path has been that anything that I've wanted to use has been something that you can pick up on the high street. Maybe we'll we'll come back to that a bit later. Um, so I had this phone. I had the ability to record. I had the ability to email those audio recordings straight into the BBC's content management system. Uh, and I had all that all those settings. I knew all the settings. 
but nobody really wanted me to do it. And so what happened is what has happened through various organizations. RTE uh, has uh, has done exactly the same thing. It's happened in exactly the same way there. It's happened in exactly the same way at an awful lot of broadcast organizations around the world. I did it secretly and I did around my recordings. I chopped up my little recordings and made them into a rudimentary mixed package. It was just two or three clips all put together in, in one little bit. And I then sent it in and then waited. And I waited to find out if anyone actually noticed that it had been recorded on a phone. Of course, they didn't. And that's the great big thing about mobile journalism, that what you're after and what's most important are the voices that you hear, the stories that you hear and people's, uh, people's storytelling. And that's the most important thing. And actually, the technology that we use is very, very important, but you've got to get away from that and start moving towards the story. And so nobody noticed that I'd, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd sneak this in under the radar. And I carried on doing it for, for quite a few months. And eventually someone said, oh, um, you know, uh, what, what recorder are you using, Nick? And I came clean and said it was the iPhone. Everyone went ballistic with me. Uh, they weren't happy at all. And yet, they all as they were doing it, they realized very, very much that what they were seeing was a, a new development. And now the the uh, the iPhone, primar primarily the iPhone, has become uh, almost accepted by by nearly every reporter. Every reporter has software on their iPhones. We're training thousands and thousands of journalists to be able to use them as news gathering tools because they simply are fantastic. They are a radio car in your pocket. They're a, a complete Swiss army knife in your pocket as well. It allows you to do so many, many different things. But is, is that this... a blessing and a curse? Because in a sense, you know, uh, you work for a radio station. But when you go out, because you've got a phone which can do absolutely everything, um, aren't you getting demands say, oh, we could really do with the picture for the website? Or could you get a bit of video because we need that and... for the news channel? And at which point is it kind of, well, this is actually, instead of making my life easier, has actually made it a bit of a nightmare. Um, the reason that I did this was, uh, was as, as I said, about the amount of weight and the amount of gear that I had to carry. It was also out of pure and utter laziness. I am quite proud of the fact that I wanted to try and cut the corners. Uh, we would call it, if we, were, if we were being really arty about it, we'd say I was trying to create a workflow to make it work in the best possible way. But the truth is, is that I wanted to have an easy life. I wanted to, to add extra things to my bow, but I wanted to make the core job of recording uh, an interview much, much easier. If you look at what we had before the iPhone, I used to go out with a digital audio recorder. Uh, I think it was either a Marantz or a Nagra I used to use. I then had to feed that audio into a laptop computer. I then had to find a network connection. If I was out on the road, I had to find, frankly, uh, a fast food restaurant with a Wi-Fi network. And I then had to uh, squirt that, uh, that, that video, that audio file, down the line, down the free network, which was invariably awfully slow, and send it into, into our base at London. And so that was an awful lot of hardware and an awful lot of problems that you had to overcome. You had to find a fast food restaurant. You had to log on to the network. You had to make sure that you hadn't been there in the last 30 days. Otherwise, there'd be all sorts of problems. It just it <laughs> That's just not how people work. imagine the glamour of working for the BBC, it, is it? There was no glamour in it at all. Now, if I take you to what my, my normal working day is, I'll go out, I'll record some interviews, I'll pop a pair of headphones in my pocket, I'll wander into a nice coffee shop, I'll sit there, I'll do my editing on my uh, my machine with my, my nice cup of coffee, uh, and press send, it gets emailed in in seconds, uh, and then I can sit back and relax for a little while. It has made life so immeasurably easy. And really, it's only fair in that respect that uh, I make my life a little bit harder. And so I have no problems at all with being asked to to do video, to do photographs. What's interesting is that when it first happened, when, when reporters were asked, first of all, to start taking photographs. Uh, I remember a newspaper that um, that I knew somebody who worked at who where the reporters were told to go and take photographs. And strangely, all the photographs came back with a finger over the actual lens just to make sure that they were completely and utterly unusable. But very quickly, the reporters started to realise that what they could do is because they were actually at the story at the time and they didn't have another person with them with an awful lot of kit and a tripod and all sorts of bits and pieces, that you started to get a different relationship with the person that you were talking to. 
And this is central to the whole concept of mobile journalism. What you do is because you're on a one to one basis, I don't have any technicians or producers or microphone holders with me or camera people with me. It's just me and my equipment. You start to build up very quickly a great rapport with the person that you're talking to. They open up in a completely different way. Now, they don't open up uh, and and let things slip that they don't want to talk about. It's not that type of uh, of opening up at all. But what they do is they give you a more honest uh, interview. They give you they give you the nuggets of what you want an awful lot quicker. You don't have to hang around doing an interview for 45, 50 minutes before you start to get to the real the real grain of the story. And people don't, don't start think to talk to you much easier. That's possibly one of the things that, you know, when it comes to mobile journalism, people talk about all the technology and the apps, and we'll talk about those in a second. But it, at the end of the day, it's stories and that ability to get the answers out of people in a more relaxed way, because people are used to being recorded and filmed and pictures taken on a phone, so they relax a lot more. Um, yeah. It's one of those kind of there's, there's underestimated there's a, values. It is, but there is something really interesting, which uh, I'm hoping to be able to to explain more at MojoCom. Uh, and this is something that happened a few weeks ago. I was on uh, what the BBC called hostile environment training, which is where uh, you get chased around the the countryside by former SAS soldiers who take great delight in scaring the bejesus out of reporters uh, as they as they go about. Sounds their, like their a great day, day out. Yeah. It's a great day out. It's about three or four days of greatness. Uh, and after after three or four days of being dragged around in the mud and having sandbags put over your head, it's not that great. However, I was talking to one of the security advisors who told me uh, a really interesting thing. He said that he'd been uh, at a refugee camp in uh, Central Africa. And a camera person was there with a full ENG camera. And there was no problem with them filming. However, the reporter, the the camera person wanted to to get some shots that he could very quickly upload onto the internet. And he pulled out his, his smartphone and started recording. And at that point, the family of the person that he was interviewing intervened. They were not at all happy because what they thought was they thought this was photo tourism they thought that this was somebody who was taking snaps and not being a professional journalist and so for the very first time and this is something that i've only heard from this from this one this one person this security advisor he said that the real problem was is that in some ways you can diminish your professional standing if you don't look professional enough so maybe Turning up with a, a battered old rucksack with a phone in your pocket and that's about it isn't the best way of doing it. They, 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 perhaps you do have to show some decorum of professionality. But also, uh, as you'll know that you have some accessories, which we'll talk about in a little while, um, that sometimes just that little extra microphone or light on the top or whatever it is can distinguish you from um, other people. And the other example I can think of was... Um, a reporter from CNN, there was a big factory explosion and he was using the selfie stick to do a piece to camera stand up. And I think some of the relatives nearby thought he was doing a, taking a selfie as a kind of tourist and confronted him. So, um, yeah, I can see there's that fine balance. But I mean, you've worked on some really big stories. Um, I mean, let's talk about one or two of them. I think, you know, Nepal and Paris come to mind. I mean, Paris, you wrote a very interesting blog article there. How was that experience reporting with that using your phone? Right. Um, 2015 was a very strange year for me. It started by mistake. Uh, I was the nearest reporter to an airport when the Charlie Hebdo shootings happened. And I didn't have time or baggage capacity to grab very much kit. The shootings had happened at about 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning. I got a phone call immediately afterwards saying, could I get to the airport? There was a flight at around one o'clock in the afternoon. We wanted to bring our drive time program, which goes on air at four o'clock in the afternoon from Paris. And so there really wasn't very much time for me to pack it. I threw what I could in my bag. I took a satellite transmitter, which is a a, a small satellite transmitter about the size of a hardback book. Uh, And I took some other equipment with me that will work no matter what the environment. You don't need to rely on phone signals. But I also took uh, a phone, uh, a couple of microphones, pair of headphones, uh, my usual um, mojo kit, my mobile journalism kit, uh, threw them in a bag and got to the airport as quickly as I could. By four o'clock, we were in uh, the Place de la République. And uh, at that point, uh, we were able to start broadcasting. Now, what was interesting about that was that as a, that as a moment wasn't a, a moment that I could leap on the air 
because what I can use my iPhone for for streaming live audio as well, uh, a bit like a FaceTime audio call, but in uh, or a VoIP call, uh, but in very high quality, which is is good enough for broadcast. Uh, I couldn't use my phone for that. I wish I could say now that you know I'd use my phone for every single thing that I was there, and I never used the satellite dish. That 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 wouldn't happen, and it didn't happen because there were twenty five thousand people in the Place de la République, all using their smartphones to get on Facebook or whatever. And so the mobile phone networks were completely drowned. However, because I had my satellite dish with me, that punches a signal straight onto a satellite, and I was able to broadcast over that. Now, so did I actually use my phone? Of course I did. I was taking photographs with it all the time. I was using it to record interviews, which I then played down the line of the satellite feed. And so we were able to get interviews out that way as well. During the, it was literally 48 hours between the beginning of the, uh, the, the Charlie Hebdo shootings and the deaths of the, the men involved, uh, probably about 20 miles to the north in a, in a village um, just near uh, the, the main airport, the Charles de Gaulle airport. Um, but in that 48, 60 hours, uh, I broadcast probably about 85 items on, on air which is an awful lot when you think, That's you know, it. I had to sleep as yeah. well. Um, a lot of those were done uh, in smaller and quieter areas of Paris, and they were done via the phone. And of course, Nick, you also covered the second Paris attacks. Yeah, these were in November 2015. And what was interesting there was that I took my satellite and I took uh, all my usual broadcast gear for recording in, and broadcasting in areas where I can't get a phone signal. But because of the increase in capacity in the 4G network in France, just in the six months while I'd been gone uh, since the Charlie Hebdo shootings, I used the, the 4G network consistently right the way through. So there were 80 broadcasts over the week. Uh, they were all done. And what was really amazing about that was that uh, there were developments in the story. I was out filming uh, at a hospital and there was a huge development in the story. The, 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 the news desk phoned me up and said, any chance of of getting your satellite up and being able to 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 broadcast and by the time they'd said that i'd already got my other phone out had pressed the connect buttons on the the app that we use lucy live and i was live up to the studio immediately and able to go so that means that frankly you're using you you're you're broadcasting in broadcast quality just as quickly as as people can phone you and have a phone conversation with you and that happened throughout uh, everywhere we went we were able to broadcast uh, and uh, it was just staggering that that this meant that you know this was an end to all the satellite trucks and we were hours ahead of everybody all the time because they had to manipulate and move large vehicles and large numbers of staff whereas we were able to jump in a taxi head off to wherever the story was developing or happening or the police raids were happening and we were there two three hours before everybody else so in a breaking story you're mobile and connected which is vital from paris in january i was in malta working there in uh march uh, i got home from i'd been doing a story about a uh, about a migrant ship that had sunk with the deaths of 900 people uh, i got home on the friday night and on the saturday morning the nepal earthquake hit uh, i messaged my 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 news editor and just said one word and just sent him a text message and said nepal uh, and he said okay let's work for it and so i in the background i was i was getting my kit together uh, and I needed an awful lot of kit for Nepal with me um, in, because we couldn't sleep inside uh, the hotels because it was so dangerous. So I had to take uh, sleeping bags, tents, all that sort of thing, and my broadcast kit as well. And in the other, on the other side, my news editor was racing around trying to make sure that it was safe for me to be able to go out there. I went out on the Sunday, and on the Monday, we were live in Kathmandu. So really, we had to use the right tools for the right job. And an awful lot of the time that meant using a satellite transmitter uh, and using my smartphone for 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 some of the other purposes, recording interviews, firstly, but also gaining material, getting information. I was using it to to get emails about what I was supposed to talk about, who I was supposed to meet, where I was supposed to travel to. And then we went up into the mountains, into one of the most uh, remote parts of Nepal to uh, an area called Sindhupalchok. And now this was uh, an area that nobody had got to. We were the first reporters to actually get there. And I was with a uh, with 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 a proper, as I say, proper uh, an, uh, a news camera operator 
uh, and another reporter from BBC News as well. And we got into this village uh, and literally we would it had taken us four and a half hours to actually get there. And it was only about 60 miles from Kathmandu. So it was an incredibly difficult journey. When we got there, we found this village which had been flattened. There was nothing left of it at all. Every single building had been damaged in one way or another. There were people buried dead underneath the streets that we were walking on that were filled with rubble. Uh, people were sitting around. They didn't know what to do. Nobody had turned up. They had kept waiting. They kept expecting the army and the, the rescue forces to turn up and nobody had turned up. And this was five days, four days after the, 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 the earthquake had happened. Uh, we got there and for some reason I picked my phone out of my pocket, I don't know why, uh, and looked at the 3G signal because there is only 3G in, Katma, in in Nepal, not 4G. But the 3G signal was really, really good and really strong. And I speed tested it and I was getting fantastic speed test results. Now, when I speed test things, I'm checking to see what the, the capacity of the line is and whether it's good enough for me to broadcast on. And I realised it was. Periscope had only just been launched. It had been launched during MojoCon 1. And this was two weeks after that. So it had very, very few people actually uh, aware of it, really. Uh, but this amazing 3G signal meant that I, I was able to broadcast. And uh, I was able to broadcast live onto 5 Live using my satellite. And then I thought, what, what about doing Periscope from here? And so I was able to press a couple of buttons and broadcast live over the Internet. Uh, from the scene of the the biggest devastation that you could possibly imagine. And, and was uh, it, you know, the way that you would do your kind of live report on Periscope as opposed to your five live reporting? Did you Would you approach that differently the way that you... I know it's visual as opposed to audio, but did, it's social media live versus broadcast live? Right, that's a really interesting uh, point. And again, it's something that we're going to talk about at MojoCon. Um, at that point, it probably was done as a form of standard broadcast. It was me explaining what I could see around me. Uh, and if truth be told, I was probably talking too much and not letting the pictures tell their own story. Um, but if you have a look at some of the the footage from that, that, that periscope, you can see the shake in my hands. The reason that it was shaking so much was because I was shaking because of what I was seeing. Because as I went around live on the air, I was seeing things for the very first time. This wasn't some some set that I was just taking you around and exploring with you that I knew back to front. This was just me coming across some children's books that were lying in the mud. Uh, and that was their school books. That was me, something which was utterly awful and totally unmistakable and smelling that live while I was on air. And so um, it really was, it was, it was shocking. And you can see the shake in, in the camera uh, as I'm doing it. And so I think... But, but, but just sorry to butt in there, if, if you were doing that sort of for a TV, BBC news channel... You wouldn't um, do it. No, they, you wouldn't do it like that. You'd do a standard it, piece of camera, wouldn't you? You'd stand and and you would be worried about what you might broadcast live, and there'd be delays and everything. Did that go through your mind whilst you were doing this? Like, should I be doing this? Is um, this, you know, ethical? Right. There was there was an interesting point after the first one. We moved on to a second village, and again the signal was strong there. And so I talked there to uh, to the camera again. And at that point, as I was turning around, I realized that coming down the pathway to me was a stretcher with a dead person on it. Uh, and immediately it was obvious that this was not something that I should be broadcasting. So I switched around and explained to the camera that what was happening and that this wasn't the type of thing that I wanted to show that if, if anyone had seen anything, then uh, I apologized for that. Uh, and that I'd come back later when when time permitted. It was a much more informal way of broadcasting. It wasn't the way that you would do it normally. Um, but I, I think that maybe broadcasters need to develop perhaps a more informal style when it comes to live streaming over over the internet. For and could time. you argue for anything in the sense that uh, with social media, um, people expect 
to you know be able to tweet backwards and forwards with uh, reporters and this has been something that broadcasters have often worried about you know should we actually let reporters sort of have a personality and um you know a- add a bit more to it do you think I mean, I, that in a I sense a, reporting is changing in that I way i make a i very very early on that year in nepal probably maybe in malta beforehand uh I, th- I think it was in Malta. Uh, I, I got some critical uh, comments on Twitter uh, and I took it upon myself that I, I wanted to respond. And so started up a conversation, not just I know an awful lot of reporters just don't bother and don't don't engage at all. And I thought it was really important that I did engage. And so right the way through the year, I've had a policy of always engaging, even when it's it's got ludicrous sometimes and you 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 end up in a really convoluted conversation with somebody but i think that's more important than that if we're using social media it can't be us just broadcasting to social media we have to engage with it and we have to engage with the people who are frankly our customers at that point who are looking at what we're doing they're trusting what we're doing they want to have some say they want to have some input and it's only fair that broadcasters actually engage and they don't just shut these people off and don't answer their their questions it's really important i think okay now you know you said that you had to pack quite a lot of kit because of the circumstances there but if you were going and doing a story just normally around the uk um what kit and apps would you use so that you had enough to do the job but you weren't kind of taking away the mobileness of it um by having too much stuff right um I'm a great believer in trying to use as little kit as possible. And also when you do buy kit that you don't buy it from uh, a specialist supplier that you're buying it from uh, a high street shop. Um, The reason being that if you have your kit confiscated, if you get your kit lost or broken, that you can replace it and get back up on the air almost immediately. If, for instance, I'd been using a standard digital recorder, a Nagra or a Marantz, and I'd broken that, I'd have to wait three weeks or so before a new one turned up. Um, Maybe, if I'm lucky nowadays, I might get it that week, but I really wouldn't be able to go into a store that day, pick up another one, and get back up and running. With the whole smartphone um, revolution, it means that you, you can do that. Maybe you don't even need a phone. Maybe you could go and get an iPod Touch, which has got just as, just the same capabilities, uh, apart from the, the phone itself. And you could get back up and running for another 160, 180 pounds. Um, and that's that's really key. So the kit that I carry around with me uh, goes in two parts. It's in two bags. First of all, there's a uh, um, like an airport bag, the type that you, you can use as airport luggage. That carries in it my satellite transmitter, uh, the the piece of kit which is an ISDN codec uh, and some headphones and a microphone and the power supplies for that and some batteries and that's my my standard uh, satellite broadcasting kit. The second bag that I carry is a large camera bag and in that I have um, I keep it all in um, Marks and Spencer's uh, ladies makeup bags which are completely clear and transparent bags. So you can see what's in there. And you can bring your makeup as well. I can bring my makeup as well. Yeah, yeah. Everything's all in there. Uh, <laughs> but what I can do is I can see what's in each bag. So I have one bag with a TV kit, which is an earpiece, uh, a little headphone splitter and a personal mic. In fact, that's the earpiece. And there's the microphone. The microphone is a, a Rode Smart Lab, which costs about £40, about €40, Euros, €45, Euros, I think they are. Uh, the earpiece... Well, you can pick one of those up. This is a custom made one, but you can pick one of these up for for 10 or 20 euros in in any high street uh, security type shop or or electronics type shop, which is where I got my first ones from. And and that's it in terms of that and a tripod mount uh, that you can pick up in an Apple store anywhere and a cheap tripod. It's a really cheap tripod. I've got a big, expensive tripod. And frankly, it's useless because it's so big because I want it small. I want it to be able to carry it on my shoulder or in my camera bag or whatever. And you don't need a big tripod if it's not carrying a heavy if weight. If it's not really. carrying a heavy weight. Oh, exactly. And, you know, the beauty of the whole using an iPhone is they're so small. They're small. They're low profile. It means that you don't stand out from the crowd. I've just got a bag that doesn't look like a camera bag. 
uh, but it's got all the right compartments. It's got all the right pockets to be able to throw everything in. So that's my, t- my TV bag, my TV bag inside there. I've got another one with a couple of external microphones that I can plug into the iPhone. But if I can possibly do it, I will always try and use the internal mic of the iPhone. My biggest thing that I never, ever leave home without, in fact, I've just reached into the car park, car pocket uh, in the door to go it, is this. This is this costs four pounds ninety nine. It's a fifty millimeter windshield that goes over the end of the iPhone and cuts out all the wind noise. You, I, I have about half a dozen of those uh, littered around the car in my house, so I never ever uh, am going short of one of those. If I lose one, it's the first thing I go out and replace, and that means that all your broadcasts and all your interviews. They don't get hit by wind noise. And yes, there are some very, very nice microphones that you can get to put on the the iPhone as well uh, or any other smartphone, whichever one you want to use. The danger with them is, is that you forget them. The one thing that you don't do is you don't forget your phone. In the back of my phone, I have two credit cards that I, I always keep in there uh, and a photocopy of my passport and my driving license. And that's really enough to get me going in any any cases or any and get me to anywhere. Um, so that's and really you, it. So that's case. your hardware. And what about the actual apps? What, what do you right. record with right. and what do you edit all with? My audio, all my audio is recorded now on an app called Ferrite. I've only ever really used two apps. One was Vodio which uh, was a brilliant, brilliant multi-track audio editing record, uh, editing and recording piece of software. Uh, that's been superseded at the moment by Ferrite. Uh, Ferrite, uh, even in its, its free version, is simply staggering. Uh, you can record, I think it's four or five tracks of multi-track audio. You can pick up those tracks. You can move them around. You can create the type of collages of audio that you, you'd hear on, on high-end speech broadcast radio and i'll tell you a little story about why why multi-track is the way forward uh i got sent over to holland to go and do a piece uh, in a, a home for people suffering from dementia uh, i went and recorded the interviews in the morning and then in the afternoon i was on the 45 minute train journey back to the airport i edited the audio into the right sections there i scripted my piece i went into the uh, the the prayer room at Schiphol Airport, and I recorded the links uh, to the piece in the prayer I hope room. Didn't disrupt people playing. Uh, yeah, praying. Well, so. um, there's probably a couple of people who probably didn't get their prayers answered on the basis of what I was saying. Um, jumped onto the plane, mixed the piece on the plane. As I landed at the airport, I turned my phone back on, pressed send, and by the time I was through customs, a ten minute long piece for BBC Radio Four. Uh, was sitting in the the producer's in tray. Now the the producer had put aside a day and a half of editing in a studio with a studio engineer and me and the producer, all three of us working for a day and a half. And instead, by the time I landed back in the country, the piece was finished and ready to go to air. And that's 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 really very highly crafted end. Uh, audio. Most of the time, I'm doing quick interviews with members of the public, which are just sort of like stitched together in as, as nice a way as I can possibly do it. But using multitrack means that you can move the audio around, getting the people to say the things that follow. So instead of having uh, a collage of, of of answers that don't make any sense, you can get these. You can get the people that you're talking to to all flow in a beautiful, beautiful manner. And people listen to the inter- interviews afterwards and go, "Wow, isn't it lucky that everyone said it in the right order?" Of course they didn't. You're moving that audio around, and you're yeah. making the story as strong as you possibly can. And all that can be done on an iPhone. That again, and, and, used I mean, to that's, that's re- so much re- equipment. I mean, more and more radio is moving away from those greatly crafted, edited pieces. Um, so it's fantastic you're still doing some of that. Um, but live, um, is it Lucy Live that yeah, you use uh, right. for well, a, an audio app? Yeah, I mean, uh, we use a, an app called Lucy Live, which is uh, a voice over internet protocol app, which uh, we're, we're doing this interview at the moment over Skype, which is another form of VoIP in effect. It, it's video over IP. Uh, but what what these, these apps do is that it basically means that it sounds like you are in the same room as the person that's presenting the program. Uh, Lucy, we use Lucy Live mainly because it has the phone book involved, in, included that allows me to go to any of the hundreds and hundreds of BBC studios around the country and around the world. 
Um, but there are, you know, if you were on a, a shoestring as a radio station, you could set it up with Viber, with uh, FaceTime audio, with anything really. I mean, with 3G voice, which is, you know, which is more and more common now. There are so many ways that you can you can get the same results. It means that your reports never have to be on the phone again or sound as if they're on the phone. You're just using it, but it sounds like you're in a studio. Now, I mean, all this stuff is great, but we're running out of time. So a couple of quick things. Firstly, five years from now, looking forwards, how do you see your job or the type of job you do changing like the way you make it the way you share it how different will it look i don't know if it'll ever even exist in five years the the because the the rise of of ugc of user generated content may make my my whole post redundant um i think that the technology we're getting to a point now where we don't know whether to make phones bigger or smaller for years and years we've been trying to make the devices smaller so that we could fit them in a pocket now of course we're moving the other way whereas so the, the screen estate uh, is more important i mean what will inevitably happen is that pro end apps will come to smartphones and tablets so you'll get final cut pro working beautifully on a smartphone you'll get uh, you know avid really working well on, on Android devices as well. Uh, it's inevitable that that means that uh, there'll be more and more uh, on the road editing, uh, that, you know, that will change the the amount of people that are involved in, in broadcasting. Uh, I, I, some people say, my God, what you're suggesting is that there's no role for production staff. I actually see it quite the other way. I think that production staff will become the journalists uh, and the, that the journalists who don't have the skills uh, will be in the dumpster uh, and that the, those production people that, that have the skills, it's very, very easy, I believe, to, to become good reporters. It's very, very difficult for good reporters to become good at production skills as well. And it's the marrying of that. If it's anything that I've been able to do successfully, uh, I'm not the world's most brilliant reporter. I'm not the world's most brilliant producer. Uh, producer but what i've been able to do is to take both of those roles and really try and multi-skill as much as i possibly can to to get it doing there's one thing that i haven't mentioned yet we talked about lucy live on on radio of course you can do live television off uh, a smartphone as well there are there are apps by companies like wmt quicklink uh and digero as well which is going to be at mojocom and those are are, are ways that you transform the way that we operate and it's not just transforming in terms of the amount of kit it's not just about carrying a small amount of kit what it means is instead of having a huge satellite truck with a huge satellite dish on it that basically you may as well put a target on the thing uh, so that people will come and either cause you trouble or will attack you what you have is you have a smartphone on a tripod or even a smartphone being held by a colleague or a member of the public as you broadcast live. And that means that you are low profile, that you're not going to get in the way, you don't get seen, you are safer. You're all, if, if you're running a radio station or a TV station, your staff are safer as a result of these things. And that is a really huge thing that the the, the, the bosses that maybe aren't, aren't quick to or keen to, to take up the idea of mobile journalism, that's something they really should consider. Well, I have to say, I, I salute you for, you know, pushing things forward technically. But um, I think the reason you have a future, um, having listened to lots of your reports, is um, in a time when so many reporters are trying to be the story and um, dominate the story, um, you're happy to kind of get out of the way and let other people, you know, bring you close, bring the audience closer to the viewer. And I think also... Um, you know, your style has a lot of, for want of a better word, humanity, which I think is what resonates. And I think that's a skill in itself beyond all the technical side of things. So I think you will be employed in the uh, the future. At least I hope you are. Um, but um, if you're feeling down about it, I'll buy you a, bit, buy you a beer at MojoCon. Um, but thank you very much for taking time whilst sat in the rain in uh, whereabouts in, uh, in this Manchester. Is, this is Manchester and no surprise that Manchester is raining. It is the wettest place on earth. Okay, right. That's the cricket team's excuse for never winning the uh, county <laughs> championship, isn't it? You know, all the games get rained off. But thank you very much for your time. And um, if people want to find out more about you and some of your tips and blogs, uh, where do they right, go? Right. I have a blog at nickgarnet.co.uk. Uh, there's also an absolutely priceless resource at the BBC Academy website as well, uh, where we look at all sorts of not just... Uh, 
techniques in broadcasting in terms of hardware, but techniques in terms of the way that we operate as well. Uh, and that's a really, really good resource that people should look at. Great. Well, um, get yourself out of the rain, get yourself a nice cup of tea, and uh, thanks for thanks for your time. Take care. If you like this podcast, don't forget to subscribe. And we'd love it if you would leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. To get in touch with Mark, go to www.purplebridgemedia.com or tweet him at Mark Egan Video.